Uh, you will find in your notebook uh, uh, kind of a, an overview of the course and a syllabus. Uh, we're going to follow pretty closely the, uh, uh, the outline. You'll find an outline in there as well that's an outline of the slides that are going to appear. So you really don't have to write the things that are on the slide. They will be uh, in the notes. And uh, let me tell you what a, a joy it is to be here. And this has been on my mind and heart for a long time. This phrase, uh, the, the, we're going to talk about the storyline of the Bible. That is what the Bible is about from beginning to end. And I put that phrase, the gospel is drama. Now, that immediately raises questions. You mean this is make-believe? No. Uh, drama has to do with saying and doing things. And what we have is a theodrama. What we have is God has been saying and doing things, and the Bible is an inspired, infallible record of what God has been doing and saying. So our focus is not just on the Bible. Our focus is on the God who has written this. We're going to talk about how that works. And we want to understand what he's been doing and where we fit in the storyline of the Bible. And so you'll see the course description and the rationale. Uh, I'm not going to, to read that. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the textbooks as we go through the uh, uh, the, the slides before us. This uh, again is our first session of the Grace Ministry uh, uh, Grace Ministry Training Network, Grace Fellowship Ministry. Well, you know what it is, so I won't say that. Uh, I am uh, Pastor Gary Scott. I pastor Middle Valley Baptist Church, and we are going to look at the storyline. And I'll try to make that clear as we go through this. There are three really critical textbooks. Uh, one of them is Kingdom Through Covenants. Now, I need to turn it this way so you understand you won't read this in your lunch break. This is really heavy stuff, but it is wonderful stuff. They now have it on Kindle for 11 bucks. So $31 for this, uh, you can buy it on Kindle for uh, $31. It is uh, by uh, Steve Wellham and Peter Gentry. It's just some of the best stuff that you'll ever see. Many of the things that we're going to talk about, you'll find expanded in here. If you just look at the size of this book, there is no way in 10 sessions we cover all of that. You know, so we will be selective. The other two books that I want to point out is one by John Piper. It's called God's Passion for His Glory. And this is really an explanation of Jonathan Edwards' great work, The Ends for Which God Created the World. We're actually going to talk about that in a bit. This is a book you can go online and download a PDF file. It won't cost you a dime. Uh, and there's actually one of the assignments that uh, uh, we are going to uh, suggest that you do for the coming week from that. The other one is a new book that I just uh, acquired in the last two weeks by... Um, uh, James Hamilton. It's called God's Glory in Salvation Through Judgment. And it essentially takes you through every section of the Bible and shows how that is the center or the theme. It is the glory of God in salvation, but it always comes through judgment of one sort or another. This is new to me. I am just absolutely thrilled with that. And so uh, I, at the last minute, included that. I want to point out what we are going to be doing. This is the syllabus. You'll see that there's a paper in there that will give this in more detail. What we're going to talk about today is why would God create this world? There was a point of time there was nothing except God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit in this uh, uh, wonderful relationship. Why did he create the world? We're going to talk about that. Next week, we're going to talk about the king and queen of creation, their rise and their fall. This is going to be a very important part. If you don't understand the first 12 chapters of Genesis, you won't make heads or tails out of the rest of the Bible. And so we're going to spend a lot of our time right at the beginning to lay that foundation. 
The next week, the plot thickens, the aftermath of the flood. Noah is critical in the development of the storyline. Uh, Adam is the, the one that God first places there and enters into this covenant with, and then that is reestablished with Noah, and uh, Noah messes up, uh, and we come to Father Abraham. Uh, he becomes the channel of blessing. God did not design that he should just be the recipient of the blessing, but he should be the channel. The blessing would come to him so that it would go out to all the world. There, there's probably no more important character in the Old Testament than Abraham. In fact, if you look at the first verse of the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. If you want to know the three key characters in the Bible, it's Abraham, uh, David, and Jesus Christ. That is the line through which God's blessing is going to come. We're going to look at that. We're going to talk about the river baby, uh, alienation. Uh, uh, God, in essence, took uh, his people and placed them uh, in this incubator for 400 years so they could grow to the people that they should be and entered into one of the most important covenants, the Mosaic Covenant. We'll be looking at that. Uh, on October 20th, the promised seed, David's greater son. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, if you don't understand 2 Samuel 7, you don't know what the Bible's about. That is at the very heart of everything. The line goes from Abraham to David to Jesus Christ. Now, again, generations in between, but those are the key points that we'll be looking at. We're going to look at the great divorce. The hope grows dim. How the nation of Israel goes into exile, they're a mess in so many ways. You can read it in Isaiah, you can read it in Jeremiah, you can read it in Ezekiel, uh, and we are going to look at that. November 3rd, God shows up. I love this part. The Messiah arrives, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now here's the glory of this drama. It is not only is God writing this drama, but he stars in the drama. He actually enters into space and time in human form in order to do what nobody else was able to do. So we're going to look at uh, God showing up in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we come to the day of Pentecost, the new covenant, and the Spirit arrives. The Spirit comes and does the things that we read about in the book of Acts, and then the final curtain, new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth merge. Now, I know in 10 weeks we can't cover everything in that, okay? But I want you to see that the Bible is not a systematic theology. The Bible really is a story that takes you from the beginning to the end. Now, embedded in that are some wonderfully important truths. But I want you to see that there is a storyline here. And uh, uh, let's begin by talking about why would God create this world? Uh, if you read Jonathan Edwards' stuff, uh, you'll benefit greatly from that. What is God's purpose in creation? Why God was not under any necessity to create, why did he do that? Uh, in order to, to understand that, uh, we're going to have to talk about how we construe Scripture. That's probably a new word. That's not a word we use a lot. It really is how do we use Scripture. We're going to look at that tonight. This is a quick overview of what we're doing tonight. Uh, understanding typology with some of our the pastors, we talked about that. That is critical. You cannot understand the Bible if you don't understand what typology is, and it's not what you think, believe me. We'll come to that in a minute. We're going to talk about progressive covenantalism. That is really the term that uh, Wellam and Gentry have used to distinguish themselves from covenant theology and dispensationalism. And we're going to talk about kingdom-centered theology, uh, how this is really about the kingdom. The kingdom is already there at the very beginning in Genesis 1, and it's going to continue on through the very end. 
And then finally, the place of story or implotment. You know, why, why do we have this particular plot and what does it do? So that's where we're going tonight. We'll see how far we, uh, we get through that. So let's begin with God's purpose in creation. Why did God create this world? Now, what you need to understand is this doesn't come out of a vacuum. Nothing exists as far as we can understand, except the Father and the Son and the Spirit, in a sense, I'm calling it a triune community. There was relationality. There was love. Uh, it uh, expressed uh, this eternal fellowship that they had. Never a disagreement, never a fight. None of them are looking for the glory, but it was shared with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to throw a word up here that you're going to say, what is that? But you can figure it out. How many of you know what choreography is? What's choreography? Coordination. What's that? Coordination. Okay, it's the coordinated movement of people on stage. Perichoreography, it's a Greek term. It means moving around. And what this is talking about is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have been in this perichoretic dance. It has been this union, this fellowship, this joy that has always existed. So those that suggest God created this world because he was bored or he was lonely, they don't understand what was there. God didn't do this out of some need because something was missing. They had everything uh, there was to have. And out of that, there is a divine plan to go public. This fellowship, this joy, this affirmation, this love that they had for one another, God determined that it wasn't enough to keep it to himself, that they were going to publish it. He, and so I love that phrase, God goes public. He wants all of a universe that doesn't exist to see that. And so we're going to call this the big God story. The, the Bible really is telling you the story of God. As I used the term before, this is theodrama. It, what, it's what God is doing. And what you need to understand is God is the author and the playwright of this story. Now, I used to use the phrase historical redemptive. And the idea of history doesn't quite get it because history is a chronicle of what happened. So the historian doesn't plan what happened, he just records what happened. However, when the drama is written, when, when the, 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 the various scenes are laid out, the things that happen are according to God's plan. And you see, behind all of this, and Jim is going to talk about this, is the sovereignty of God. He is the one that plans it. He is the one that is going to execute it. And so God wrote the script for this drama. Everything that's taking place. This Sunday in our Sunday school, we're going to talk about the fall. Did that just happen or was that part of the script that God wrote at the very beginning? And we're going to argue nothing just happened. Everything is the unfolding of the script and God himself not only wrote it, but he's directing it. So everything that's happening in this world is because there's a script and now it's being played out. So what God does is he creates a stage now on which this drama uh, is going to take place. Greatest drama of all time. So he creates a universe, he creates a world, he creates image bearers to pl be placed here. He creates angelic spirit beings, creates a, a world with uh, all of its particular uh, uh, principles and laws that function. And here's something that, that I, I've been thinking about. God created time. One of the most difficult questions is to sort out what's the relationship between God and time. Is God within time? Is he outside of time? Is there any sequence with God? Those are some of the hardest questions, and we're not going to get into that, but I, what I want to affirm is that God created time as a medium in which the scenes of this drama would unfold. He may have done it a different way, but he chose to do it this way. 
Uh, we want to get the big picture of this and understand the whole thing. God as author and playwright, what exactly does that mean? God is the main character in this drama. Now, what that means is he says things and he does things. Sometimes he does things by saying something. When he said, let there be light, something happened. And sometimes he says things by doing things. When the flood came, there was no audible sound, but he said something. And so if you put those two together, you understand that God is saying things and he's doing things. God created angelic beings and then human beings as players in this drama. They're not robots that he just punches a code in and they do exactly what he says. And that becomes one of the challenging things for us to understand. How does all of this fit together? And, and much of when, when you listen to the news and we read about uh, Israel and Hamas, we read about ISIS, we read about North Korea, how many of the commentators talk about the part that God's playing in all of this? And what part do demonic powers have in all of this? They just scoff at that. But the fact is, if we take the Bible seriously, we, we have at least four things we need to consider. How does God fit into this? How do angelic, both good and bad beings fit into this? How do human beings fit into this? How does the creation fit into this? Because all of those are players in this drama. God himself, here is the very heart of the drama. God himself enters into created space and created time as a human being in the incarnation of Jesus Christ to bring it to its climax. God is not just standing outside watching this. God's going to come into this. Have any of you uh, seen the movie Pleasantville? Any of you seen that? Uh, Pleasantville is a story of these two young people that are watching this program on television about Pleasantville and they're just sucked into it and they become part of it. It's very much like the Chronicles of Narnia when uh, they're drawn in uh, to this as they're looking at this picture on the wall. Well, that's exactly what God does. God is directing all of this, but when you stop and think about it, the heart of it is what happened with Jesus Christ. That is the heart of the gospel. Now, we said over here, the gospel is drama. And I want to make sure that you don't just hear me talk about drama. What is the gospel? What does gospel mean? Good news. News tells you what happened and what does it mean. You listen to the newscasters. You know, fair and balanced. Uh, anyhow, uh, uh, something happened, and they're telling you what it means. That's what, that's what the gospel is. And at the heart of this is what God did. Now, as the, the author and the playwright, play, playwright, God designs that his son is going to be the hero. He is the center. He's the focus of all of this. He is going to come to rescue its people from destruction. Now, Hollywood has echoed this uh, uh, storyline over and over again. You think of the best movies, it's about that. You, you know, you watch The Lord of the Rings. I hope you read it instead of watch it, but that's another question. Uh, uh, the the storyline repeats itself over and again because it's an echo of the way the world actually is. It's the Son, the Son of God, who finally restores creation to its attended shalom and brings peace to all of this. God's purpose in this drama, and it's really important that you get this, James Hamilton's book does a great job, is to display his glory. He wants to display his glory, not just because he's an egomaniac, but because that's the best thing there is to see. And he created us for his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. It is constantly in scripture. And so I'm taking James Hamilton's term to display his glory in salvation through judgment. That's what God loves to do. Now, when we understand what we're talking about is what's happening in time and space in our world, 
it becomes important then that we understand how does the Bible fit into that, okay? And there's so much more that needs to be said. We're going to say some things quickly, uh, but I, I hope it will be meaningful to you. The Bible tells the story of this drama without distortion. You know how historians or people sometimes write things and they'll embellish it? No embellishment. This is not written by men. It's written by the Spirit of God. They move men along. So what we have recorded is actually what God said and did. Now, most people, and even many people in the evangelical world, don't believe that today. But everything that we're going to do here is based on the foundation that God's Word is an infallible, inspired account of what God has been doing and what God has been saying. Secondly, God is primarily, is directly and primarily responsible for his production. This didn't come about through men, but men were born along by the Holy Spirit. This is God's work. It is, there's nothing else in the history of humanity that compares to the word of God. And, and I want you to know, we are not studying this, okay? We're studying this, and we're going to look at this through the lens of Scripture. We're not going to look at the Bible through this lens. These are going to help us understand this, but this is what's critical. It's not what the other people say. And tonight we're going to do more introductory things. Next week we're going to go through Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to walk through that and see how that develops. But God is the one that's responsible. It's the only authorized account that we have. Every other account is subject to human frailty and human errors. Now one of the things that we need to do is to talk about how we construe scripture. And uh, I was struck by that a number of years ago. How do we use the Bible? And I want to suggest that in the evangelical world, we use the Bible in ways that aren't intended to be primary. And in, in fact, they seem to be primary, but it's not foundational at all. Let me give you some suggestions. It is not primarily a book of virtue. It's not moralism. The gospel is not about do better. The gospel is not about you climbing up a ladder. It's about God coming down to this earth and doing what we couldn't do. Now, is there moral imperatives in scripture? Absolutely, but it's not primarily a morality play. It's not primarily a book of religious experience and inward piety. Now, is this going to be something that touches our heart? Yes, but it's not primarily about how we feel about things. It's primarily about what God is saying and what he's doing. That's why we call it a theodrama. It's not primarily a therapeutic manual to help people achieve self-esteem. So much of evangelical Christianity today is about making people feel better. You know, and, and your best life here and now. I think I heard that somewhere. You know, that's not what the Bible is. Are there things that will help you feel better? Yeah, but that's not really what it's all about. It's not primarily a source for motivational stories and sayings. You know, people go to that and they'll find all these cute things. Well, there are some things that are motivational, but that's not what the Bible is. Let me say this. It's not primarily for devotional purpose and personal inspiration. Now you might, uh, wait a minute here. Now, the Bible is going to do that. It is going to nurture us, but that's not its primary purpose. Now here's why I'm going to trouble with some of you pastors. It's not primarily an encyclopedia of accurate propositional statements to be structured and organized as a true system of belief. It's not a systematic theology. The Bible isn't organized bibliology, theology, pneumatology, hermartiology, eschatology, uh, and so forth. It's not that. Now, within the Bible, we have all of that. So, again, I want you to hear, I'm not saying that none of those things are part of the Bible. I'm saying that's not primarily what the Bible is. Well, what is it? 
it's not simply a story that invites you in or says stay away. There's a lot of stuff out there about narratives and going to this idea of story and narratives that I think misses what the scripture actually is. So what is it? This is a carefully worded statement and I want to walk through this. The Bible, everybody gets that, is the canonical record now, canon, don't think of Civil War, okay, and, and Mount Lookout up there where they've got the canons. Uh, this is 1N. What does that mean? What does canon mean? What's that? Okay, officialized, it's a standard, it's the rule, it's what everything is measured from. So the Bible is a canonical record. Think inspired, infallible, absolutely accurate. It is a record of the great redemptive drama that God is staging in the world to bring glory to himself by blessing his world. That's what this is all about. The Bible wants to tell a story so that God is going to be magnified and people are going to be drawn to that. Now, the Bible records the drama in such a way that those who read it are drawn into it. As we begin to read it, what happens to people's hearts? They begin to be challenged and warm, and the next thing they know, they go from being a skeptic to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And God intends that the Bible accomplish that very thing. And then, when we become a Christian, what does Scripture become? It becomes our script, tells us how we live. It tells us how we play our part uh, in this drama of redemption as we await for uh, the restoration and the renewal of this world. Now, let me, let me pause there for a moment. Comments, questions. Now, I, I, I recognize that almost every time that people hear this idea of the Bible is drama, something is rattling around inside. And I want to pause for a moment to give you a chance. Comments, questions? Sure. Yeah. A friend of mine said, you mean play acting? Well, we can use drama, you know, on, uh, on uh, uh, go to Times Square, New York, and the theater district, uh, and yet we talk about the drama of life, the story that we're in. That's how I'm using it. That's how scripture is using it. Not as some make-believe thing, but this is what really is happening. You know, and, 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 and it's a, uh, it has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. Any other comment? Yes, Craig. Okay. And you notice the next thing we're going to look at? <laughs> In it becomes really important that we understand how we, uh, how we do that. So let's, let's, let's press into this. The Bible is a complete and a complex divine speech act, a communicative act. In fact, this is more than just a revelation to us. It is God communicating to us. It's God in dialogue with us. So when we pick up this word, it's not just simply what Paul said and what uh, 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 Ezekiel said and what Hezekiah said. It's what God said. And it's important that we grab hold of that. It is a, a carefully constructed, complete speech act it includes history, it includes Proverbs, it includes uh, the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, it includes the history of the Gospels, the history uh, in the Old Testament. It involves more than just Revelation. Revelation is it expressing or identifying something that was unknown or hidden. 
And we have that in Scripture, but there are also promises. And that's not exactly revelation. And there are demands, and there are propositional statements that he gives us, and there's much more in the Scripture. So I, I heard a, a, an old preacher say years ago, there's enough water in this pond to float your boat. You know, uh, none of you are ever going to exhaust the Scripture. There's so much more. Um, as we talk about interpreting Scripture, uh, we need to understand, and you'll see some of this in Wellam's thing, it is a word-act revelation, okay? When, when we look at it all, words are being spoken, things are being done. Let me explain that. God does things in the world. God acts. And in the, the early days of biblical theology, this was really called into question that does God actually do anything? Yes. And the Bible records what actually did. You know, God actually flooded this earth. You know, God actually came down on Mount Sinai and the whole thing quaked. You know, the, the Bible tells us what actually happened. Something happened. That's what news is about. But it doesn't just end there. You know, if the Bible said Jesus died and that's it, it's not enough. Okay, he died and he was buried and was rose again, so what does it mean? And so what we have is in the scripture, God not only, it's not only a record of what God did, but it's an explanation of what he's doing. And very often he prophesies what he's going to do, then he does it, then he comes back later and says, now this is what I did, you know, and I meant what I said, you can count on that. So God speaks and explains what his action means. We really believe that our God is a speaking God. He talks. You know, he talked to Adam, and he talked to Moses, and he talked to Elijah, and you can go through the scripture, and you can see that over and over again. Now, uh, actually, I think I had a duplication of that. I should have removed that. Uh, scripture is a progressive revelation. Let's talk for a minute what that means. What we're saying is God didn't give us this whole thing at once. It's kind of like the story of your family. It's been going on for 30 years or 50 years or 70 years. And so it is that the scripture is progressive. And what we mean by that is it's redemptive. It's about what God is doing to save this world. And it is historical. These are things that are actually happening in real history. And so it is, we can go back. If, uh, take the, the Chronicles of Narnia. Where is Middle Earth? What, what airline goes to Middle Earth? Well, none do because that's just a fiction. However, Egypt, you know, Mesopotamia, uh, Canaan, uh, those are real places that we don't just read about in the Bible the way you read about Middle Earth and the Lord of the Rings you actually can go to those places and we have history of things that happen that corroborate what scripture is talking about. Now, that's not true of any other major religion. Hinduism is not built on history. Islam is not built on history. The Christian faith is unique in the fact that it depends on these things happening in history. The primary one that Jesus came and he died. It's also eschatological. Now what we mean by that is the Bible is always looking ahead to tell us what's next. So if you're Isaiah, you're looking forward to the Messiah. You know, if you're Paul, you're looking forward to the return of Christ. If, you know, we're us where we are today, we're trusting and hoping, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, the Bible constantly has a direction. Now, we take that for granted, but if you go back and study the, the understanding of history uh, throughout the various cultures, no one had that view. That is unique to the Hebrews. And it's not that they thought it up. It's just that God spoke to them and said, there's a beginning, and there's a middle, and there's an end, and you cannot read Scripture without seeing that. Let me say this, 
there are three horizons uh, in biblical interpretation. So if you're going to understand the Bible, there are three things that you have to put in context. First of all, the textual horizon. If you, we've just gone through the book of Isaiah and uh, a sermon series at Middle Valley. Uh, if you're going to understand Isaiah, you have to go to the 8th century prophets and what's happening with uh, the various kings and the prophets and so forth. So you begin by looking at the text and trusting that what God's given in his, in, in his word is accurate. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to, to do that. Let me see if I can get back. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, here we are. We're at the right place. The three horizons of biblical interpretation. The textual horizon, the epical horizon. What, what do you think we mean by that? We need to know the context of, of, of what the text of Isaiah says. What does the epical horizon have to do? What does epoch mean? The time frame. So it matters whether you're pre-flood or post-law or after the, the Pentecost, you can't take the Bible and make every part, you know, uh, 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 equally applicable to where we are in our life today. We need to understand when you're going through Scripture, understand what time period they're in. In fact, the Salem witch trials, you know why they took place? Because they didn't understand the epical horizon. They went back to some Old Testament scriptures, said don't let us suffer a witch to live, and they killed a bunch of innocent women because of that. And so we need to appreciate the textual horizon, and we need to appreciate the epic, the time period, and we're going to be looking at that. And we need thirdly to, um, where to go? Uh, Okay, it's textual, it's epical, it's canonical. When we say canonical, we mean the whole Bible. Every time you do a study of the Bible, don't just study Titus, don't just study Malachi, don't just study Ruth. Study it in terms of the whole story. Have you ever seen a movie that right at the beginning there was a scene that just didn't make any sense? What is that all about? And the story goes on. And then you come to the end and you say, oh, that's what was that all about. And it goes back to that. And so we need to, we need to read the Bible as a whole and uh, not something that is divided into uh, segregated parts that have really no relationship. Now, we talk about typology. Uh, we talked about this with the pastors the other day, and I'm going to go through this quickly. Typology is not allegory. Uh, typology is the principal form of how the New Testament interprets Scripture. One of the great challenges is how do you relate the law of Moses to uh, the commands of Jesus Christ? The whole book of Galatians is about that. And if you don't understand typology, you're never going to be able to do that. Typology, there's a historical correspondence that links the old with the new. And it's not just something we read back into and say, oh, let me make a connection here. It's something that God intended from the very beginning. It is textually warranted and embedded. Types. Give me, uh, give me two or three types from Scripture. What are some of the types? Adam is a type of Christ. We see that used over and over again. David is a type of Christ. Aaron, Aaron the priesthood. Uh, uh, you can take the Sabbath. You can take the temple. These are things, it didn't just happen that way. And say, oh, this is, look at this. It's, look at the coincidence. No coincidence. God intended 
for Adam to find its counterpart and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So it has to be in the text itself, not something that we come up. And there has to be this intertextual development. It's going to escalate. You remember when the scripture says, a greater than Jonah, a greater than, you go, Solomon was here? It's because Christ is the fulfillment. Second Corinthians says, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. So whether it's Adam, or whether it's Abraham, or whether it's David, or whether it's Moses, it all finds its fulfillment in Christ, and Christ is above them. And it's not necessarily a straight line they're improving. I mean, it goes up and down. They all failed. Christ is the only one that ultimately prevails. It's divinely intended. Please hear this. Typology is not somebody sitting down with a creative mind and making it say something. It's what God intended. He embedded that in there. He intended Adam to mean something that you're not going to understand until you read the rest of the Bible. If you read Genesis 1 and 2, you're not going to understand the Bible. You have to read the rest of it to see how it's going to work out. Listen to this. It is grounded in providence. God intended it to be this way. It didn't just happen that way. Typology, uh, uh, I'm just going to quickly go through. There are a number of times in the New Testament, Romans 5, 14, a pattern of the one to come. That is particularly about Adam. In 1 Corinthians 6, uh, chapter 10, verses 6 and 11, they were examples for us. That is the Greek word tupas, or type. We have 1 Peter 3, 21, water symbolizes baptism. The word symbolizes is tupas. You find it in Hebrews chapter 8, 5, the pattern shown to you in the mountain. You remember when they uh, uh, actually built the, the tabernacle and then the temple, it was according to the pattern of what was in heaven. It's not like Moses sat down and decided what he wanted it to be. You know, God determined that, and he showed the pattern to them, and so that became a type of that reality that already existed that, that Christ is going to come to embody, and when Christ goes back, it's not to present the sacrifice in the temple, but he goes through the heavens into the holy place, and there he completes the work of redemption. You see it in Hebrews 9.24, a copy of the true one. Each one of those are places where Christ is a type. Typology, uh, this is a statement you'll find from Wellam and Gentry. Typology is a New Testament hermeneutical endeavor. Hermeneutics is how we interpret scripture. Uh, it, it's the study of Old Testament salvation, historical realities or types, that is persons, events, institutions. A type may be a person, Adam. It may be an event, the flood. It may be an institution, the priesthood. It can be any one of those things which God has specifically designed to correspond to and predictively prefigure their intensified antitypical fulfillment aspects inaugurated and consummated in New Testament salvation history. And I added this at the end, whose full embodiment is brought to culmination in Jesus Christ. We want to make sure it's not just about things happening, but it comes to its full embodiment in Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to say, typology is not allegory. Allegory is taking somebody and building this uh, uh, imaginary scheme of what it means. So allegory, person, places, and institutions are stood, understood as symbols that unpack hidden or deeper meaning. You can go to Origen, you can go to uh, uh, Philo, you can go to many of the ancients, and it is unbelievable what they come up with. That's not what we're talking about. 
we're talking about what in fact God intended. It has to be rooted in textual and historic realities. They're an organic relationship in the epics. They correspond to one another. Let me say this. What will help you, I think, is to recognize there are recurrent patterns that are pointing forward and culminating ultimately in Jesus Christ. Priesthood, sacrifices, a Sabbath rest. It, it's not just one time, it's over. Go back and look at Sabbath rest. Over and over again, there's a pattern. It finds its fulfillment in Christ. You remember in Luke 4 when Jesus read, was given the scroll, and he read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He uh, has uh, filled me with the Spirit to preach good news, to proclaim captives, and so forth. You remember what he said at the end? To proclaim the day of the Lord's favor, jubilee. And then he closed the scroll, gave it back to remember what he said? That's right. Today, this has been fulfilled. Something happened. When Jesus walked into Jerusalem, that was the day God was visiting the earth, and he said, you don't understand what's happening here, and they missed it. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about recurrent patterns. The relationship that exists is not arbitrary. It's not just something we come up with. It's not retroactively constructed. That is, we take it and we read something back and make a connection that's not there. You know, I got stuck uh, uh, one day. I had a flat tire or something. And I said, well, it's a good thing. Otherwise, you would have got hit by a train when you crossed the railroad tracks. Well, that's not the way this works, okay? Maybe I would have, maybe I wouldn't have. Nobody knows that, but that's not the way that this works. But it's ordained by God to point forward to Jesus Christ. So it is this promise fulfillment, this repetition of the patterns that are there. It exhibits escalation. It's constantly growing. It's always greater. The antitype is always greater. Type is the Old Testament pattern. The antitype is the fulfillment. That was always hard for me to get. It always seemed confusing. Antitype sounds like it's against it, but that's not what it means. Adam was the type. Christ is the antitype. And so there is a very close relationship between typology and and covenants. Uh, that really unpacks biblical covenants across redemptive history. And that's what we're going to be looking at. We're not just looking at stories, we're looking at the development of covenants themselves. Now, I want to take a moment. Let me, let me pause there before we go to, to the next slide. We had some time as pastors to go through this, had a little more time to do that. Questions, comments? that makes sense to you? There's a whole lot more. In fact, one of the assignments that I'm going to give you is you have in your uh, uh, notebook and uh, a short article that is from here by Steve Wellam on typology. I really encourage you. It's about five pages long, four or five pages long. It's really worth studying that and understanding that. Typology is something that's been on my heart. I was telling our pastors in 1983, I bought a book by uh, Leonard Gapelt called Typos. It was really life-changing for me. And it has framed in so many ways how I have taught and, and interpreted scripture. Let's talk about the difference between contract and covenant. We're very familiar with contracts. Uh, we see the word covenant in scripture. And so uh, I, what I want to affirm is the centrality of covenants but not contracts in scripture, that uh, uh, it becomes, covenants become the backbone of the storyline. If you're going to trace the progression of that, you have to take into account the covenants. That how, that's how it's all going to be run together. We have to connect the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, there are two basic models of doing this. This could take a month just to go through this one slide. What are the two, okay, uh, uh, we've got 100 minutes, is that what you're saying? 10 minutes, okay. Um, uh, what are the two basic modes of connecting Old Testament and New Testament? 
the theological systems everybody's familiar with. Yeah. One of them is dispensationalism. Uh, uh, you can go back to your Schofield Reference Bible and uh, a number of other things. That's very popular. There are many people that their view of Scripture was shaped by dispensationalism. The other view uh, that's there is covenant theology. Uh, covenant theology is profoundly uh, developed. Uh, many, many people embrace that. And my, when I went to seminary, I went to Bible college that was dispensational. I had issues with that. I went to seminary, there were covenant, and I had issues with that. And I came out and I didn't fit with either one. And I thrilled to see this stuff coming out because this is really a new model. It's what they've called progressive covenantalism. And that is recognizing that the historical covenants, as they develop and as they unfold, really explain the scripture. Now, here they are. You know, it's the Garden of Eden with Adam. It's the Noahic covenant. It's the Abrahamic covenant. It's the Mosaic covenant. It's the Davidic covenant. It's the new covenant. Now, this is different than covenant theology, that their covenants are conceptual and never historical. Uh, these, in fact, are biblical covenants that the scripture sets out. Now, the idea of covenant is central to the plot structure of scripture. You simply can't understand what's happening if you don't see this developing in those lines. It's the backbone in the drama of redemption that holds the entire scheme together and each of those must be properly connected to one another in order to make sense of it. You need to know what precedes it and what follows it. Uh, uh, next week, as we look at the Adamic covenant, and some are hesitant to call it that, uh, I have been in the past, I'm persuaded now that it's proper to call it that, and you're going to see from the very beginning it is kingdom through the development of these covenants from uh, Genesis 1 all the way to the end becomes so important that we understand the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is the rule of God that's mediated by Jesus Christ. It's not a place, but instead it is the rule of God. It saturates scripture. Adam what happened to Adam here? Oh, I see where I am. What I'm doing here, I forgot where I was going here. I want you to see those figures that were central in this. We're going to talk about Adam being the king of creation, and I think legitimately so. David as being the, the king. Jesus as the king. Uh, that, uh, that God established. You're going to see that in Paul. The very last statement that you read in Acts is about Paul, that he spent his time there and he talked about the kingdom of God. You're going to see that when we come to Revelation. It is all about the kingdom, about the kingdom being delivered up to the Father. And if you're going to understand the Bible, then you're going to have to understand that. Now, I, I want to just point out something that it's just a new resource that's come out. It's called the story. It's about developing uh, uh, the people in your church to learn to tell the gospel as the story of redemption. And it's important to understand, again, that's what the Bible is. All our lives, we're storied people. We're constantly telling stories. If I ask Wayne to tell us about himself, he wouldn't give us his cholesterol number and how much he weighs and where he lives. He'd start telling the story of where he grew up and the people that, that he was with. The scripture does that as well. We call that emplotment, this plot, as it develops along that's directed by God. Now, in this story, these are the, the graphics that they put together. You have four basic steps, creation and fall and restoration and, and uh, I'm sorry, redemption or rescue and consummation. And so I put, they use the uh, thing for the rescue. There is the website. Go on and look at that. You'll find that in your notes. It's called viewthestory.com. 
what are the the elements in a good story? How, how do you how do you put those things together? And uh, we're not going to have time to go through this in detail. Uh, in fact, let me get my notes up here so I can I can abbreviate this so we can come to a, a meaningful end. That um, uh, what you really have. In, uh, uh, is exposition, something happened. And then you have the, um, uh, what we call the rising action. That's where the stage is set. I'm going to skip over these slides because we won't have time to go through them. And then uh, you find the climax, the high point. In the scripture, what's the climax? Well, it's the incarnation of Christ. It's his life, it's his death, it's his burial, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, what's the resolution to that? Well, the resolution is that uh, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus Christ is going to restore what sin has broken, and, and there become four critical questions. How did this all begin? Well, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, why did it go so wrong? Uh, that is a tough question. Uh, it was because of man's sin, but that was in God's plan from the beginning. I believe he did that in order that it would provide a backdrop in which he could display his mercy that would have never been seen. Well, how are you going to fix this? Well, there's only one person that can fix this. David couldn't do it. Moses couldn't do it. Noah couldn't do it. Adam couldn't do it. Uh, Jesus Christ did. Abraham couldn't do it. And Christ does that. And to, to appreciate that and to see that what we have in the scripture is really answering the critical questions that are before every one of us. It's a great way to tell the story. Now, let me conclude by saying this. The Bible is really one big story. It's not like two different stories. God tried something in the Old Testament, it didn't work. I'm a woodworker, and I've had a few of those projects I got started, out they go, because I wasn't able to finish it. It's not like God botched it the first time, so he starts over with Jesus in the New Testament. You understand that? Everything is one story from the beginning, and everything in the old is pointing forward to Jesus Christ. And when he comes, it's the climax, it's the fulfillment, it's all of those things that are coming together. And that's why I love that passage in 2 Corinthians. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so as we go through the study, this is not going to be about just some kind of fuzzy stuff about drama. Okay? You understand that? It's about the gospel. It's about the story, this drama of what God's been doing and what God has been saying, and we have that recorded for us in the scripture. Now, let me say this. My time is just about up, though I will say I got cheated because I didn't get started at right at half past. Uh, so I think Jim will owe me some time in the future. There, there is a, a, a sheet that I put there that has uh, some assignments on that. There, there are five things that I want to encourage you to do. Uh, one of them is to, I included the page, Construing Scripture. You know, how do we use Scripture? Uh, the second one is to look at the, the article by Steve Wellam on typology and answer that question. I also want you to look at John Piper's uh, treatment of Edwards and Edwards' statement of glory. And here's the most important thing. Number four, read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Again, we're not studying kingdom through covenant. We're studying God's word. We want to know what God has to say. And then I encourage you to go to the viewthestory.com. This is really some great stuff. We're actually doing this in, uh, in our church and our Sunday school. Okay, I'm done. Uh, I'll take all your questions now. We have no time, sorry. <laughs>